Einstein said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I think it's great to start with an Einstein quote because then I'm shifting responsibility. It's now the fault of the big man. If there's anything you don't like in what I'm going to say. So Einstein said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I'm a climate activist by night and during the day I run a clean energy business in Asia. We develop, build, finance and operate clean energy projects in markets that are at the front line of the suffering from climate change. That's something that we deal with on a daily basis. The climate movement consists of thousands and thousands of people. I belong in that climate movement. Um, these thousands and thousands of people have been taking thousands and thousands of flights over the past 25 years twice a year or more from United Nations convened meeting to another United Nations convened meeting. They've been doing it over and over again and we have produced over the time period thousands and thousands and thousands of pages. And then once we do that, we start it over again and we do it again. Now, the, the problem with what we've been doing as a climate change movement is that it's not working. And that's what the facts say. That's what the math says. If you look at the increase in carbon dioxide emissions, we are at the highest point in 400,000 years, and it's not looking good at all. As a matter of fact, there is no indication that that trend is changing over the next decade or two, and therefore we are facing consequences that are detrimental and destructive to human life on the planet. So the results and the facts speak for themselves. Now even worse, I think, is the fact that aside from that climate movement, the global financial markets, a hundred trillion pound colossus, that's the value of all the stocks and bonds outstanding in the world, a hundred trillion pounds, that's the number one with 14 zeros. Those hundred trillion pounds have completely ignored anything and everything that has come out of the climate movement over 25 years of the climate movement doing the same thing over and over again. Now, if I go back to Einstein's definition, we must be completely insane. We are beyond insanity, in fact, because even as we speak, we're still doing the same over and over again. This November in Paris, the United Nations is convening yet another climate summit at which 40,000 people, 40,000 people are expected, uh, uh, which 40,000 people are expected to attend. I don't need to ask you what you think the result is going to be. I think the facts speak for themselves. That 100 trillion pound monster, the global financial markets, has got to be moved if we are going to make a difference. So if you want to change the world, I'm hoping that I am going to give you a formula today to do that. And the formula will have to do with moving that mountain. We have to move the entire 100 trillion pounds monster. Now let me take a step back uh, first. I started thinking about this issue over the past few years as I traveled the world as a member of the climate movement, surrounded by government officials, think tanks, 
scientists, university professors, consultants, again, thousands and thousands of talented people, all of whom are working very hard to achieve an objective, but all of whom have facts in front of them that cannot be denied. I thought, why not look at the history of successful, successful social movements and learn from that? Social movements have a long history of effecting change. One of the most impressive social movements, at least according to my research, is the AIDS HIV movement from the 1980s. It was very impressive because it was dealing with entrenched reticence, fear, stigma, politicians that didn't want to go anywhere near it, denialism, and other forms of exclusion. Yet, it, if you flash forward 20 years, it succeeded actually beyond anything that the leaders of that movement would have foreseen when they started. And if you look at the lessons from that movement, there are really two main ones that I'd like to draw your attention to. The first one is that the AIDS HIV movement chose its target very, very carefully. It did not get distracted by focusing on a multitude of constituencies, stakeholders, targets, etc. It decided, correctly in hindsight, to focus on big pharma, large pharmaceutical companies that were putting profits ahead of people. It had a very, very clearly defined market. You cannot say the same of the climate movement. The climate movement today, we are all over the place. You know, one, one day we want top-down global agreements to solve everything. Another day we focus on change at city level. We focus on the transport sector, the housing sector, the construction sector, the consumer sector. We are far too spread out. However, we also have a very defined target that we can focus on, and that's 90, 90 companies. 90 companies are responsible for two-thirds of man-made emissions since industrialization began. Only 90. They're all oil, gas, coal, and cement companies. All of them. And they're all around you. They love to sponsor arts. They love to sponsor museums, concerts. And they love to, if they could get on your cereal uh, box, they would as well. Now. So we have a clearly defined target, but going back to the AIDS movement, there's another lesson that we could learn from them, and that's coherence. They were very coherent about their ask. What they relentlessly pursued was the concept of universal care being available irrespective of your financial means. So if you were sick, you had to be treated, and it didn't matter whether you had an NHS or not, whether you had the money for it or whether you did not. And they pursued that relentlessly, and that struck a chord with the public and finally with the politicians. And something was then done about it, and a lot of money was mobilized to tackle what was a massive, and still is in some ways, um, challenge to humanity. Now, in terms of coherence, the climate movement also has an equivalent. That equivalent is, going back to the 100 trillion pounds, that equivalent is to increase the cost of money for the target. Increase the cost of money for the 90 polluters who are responsible for two-thirds of our man-made emissions since the beginning of industrialization. If you increase their cost of money, if you made it more difficult for them to access capital, if you increased their cost of capital, then you would simply price them out. There is really no reason why, other than the fact that they're subsidized and priced in, there's really no reason why we're not instead relying on energy from the sun and, and the wind, which are both free. 
So lesson one is let's focus the target, drawing from the AIDS HIV movement on the top 90 polluters. And lesson two is um, achieve coherence by focusing on making their cost to money higher. Now, how do you do that in a very simple way? Think about the 100 trillion pounds as this triangle. So that's the sum total of the value of stocks and bonds worldwide. At its apex here, and representing 25% sit pension funds. Pension funds are you and me. That's who has our money and is supposed to be investing it over the long term wisely and prudently. Now, that's still 25 trillion pounds. That's still a lot of money to get our heads around. However, only 20 pension funds account for 20% of that number. They are the influencers, the thought leaders of the entire pyramid of money. When they move, everybody else moves. Needless to say, the politicians also move. Therefore, what we have to do is we have to go to these pension funds and we have to go to them with two things. The first one is a nice request to take our future into account when they make investment decisions. Because at the moment, climate risks are not priced anywhere in that 100 trillion pounds. They are completely ignored. They're nowhere to be found when you find, when you buy a property in an area which science says is at a high risk of flood. They're nowhere to be found in your consumer chain, your industrial chain. They're nowhere to be found in asset prices anywhere. Climate risks aren't. So, we have to go to the pension funds and politely ask for our future to be taken into account and for them to price climate risks into their investment mandates, into their investment decisions. And the second thing we have to do is we have to tell them that they need to be prepared for the consequences if they don't. It's a very, very small universe. There's only 20 institutions that we need to go to. If they move, the 25% pension funds move, if they move, all 100 trillion pounds worth of money will move. It will price out fossil fuels, and it will price in clean energy-fueled lifestyles and a clean energy-fueled future. That's how you can change the world. Because your pension is, in fact, your responsibility. Your pension is your opportunity. And your pension is the key to taking climate change action. It's not going to be the US president or the British prime minister or even Vladimir Putin, however hard he tries, <laughs> that will change the world. It's going to be us. As a matter of fact, all it will take is about 2,000 beneficiaries of these 20 pension funds to go to them with these two asks that I mentioned before. And that's how you can change the world. And as a matter of fact, since I'm here and I'm in, all it will take is another 1,999 people. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>